and welcome to Mindset, an HCD vidcast, where we dive into the world of applied consumer neuroscience and market research with leading experts in the field. My name is Michelle Nigella, PhD in behavioral neuroscience and director of research and innovation at HCD. And I'm Catherine Ambrose, the manager of behavioral and marketing sciences with HCD. As your hosts, we are going to act as the buzzkills for the buzzwords, taking time to critically think about the limitations and pitfalls of emerging trends and topics within the field to help you identify what innovation has a lot of untapped potential or is too good to be true. Now, HCD is a full service research house which provides research capabilities on consumers by looking at how they perceive, evaluate, and respond to different types of stimuli, such as looking at product experiences, communications, or just general consumer and shopper experiences. We use a combination of tools that come from psychology, physiology, neuroscience, as well as the traditional methods that people typically use to see how they experience different stimuli. That stimuli can range from the early stages of exploration all the way through the final product validation tests. This is what we refer to as applied consumer neuroscience. So stick around for more curious conversations as we chat our way through the ever evolving space of consumer science. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Mindset. It's Catherine and Michelle here, and we are so excited to welcome this very special guest we have with us, Mujde Yuksha. Can you please share a little bit about yourself and who you are? We're thrilled to have you here today. Hello, Catherine. Hello, Michelle. Um, well, I'm Mujde Yuksha. Uh, I am currently um, uh, Associate Professor of Marketing at Suffolk University. I'm also the director of graduate programs at the university uh, in marketing as well. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, uh, it's, it's all okay. okay. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you got into your current role? And did you have any, you know, I know you have a very cool past life experience. So yeah, we want to know your origin story, basically. Yeah. So who are you? Like, where did you start? I, I think it, it's it's cool to build this origin story. Um, so tell us about life right before you decided to become a professor. Yeah, well, that was <laughs> very interesting. Uh, actually, like I have a background, a very unique background. I was a professional basketball player um, for 10 years um, back in Turkey, where I am from. I'm from Istanbul, Turkey. Um, so I've played in uh, many different like sports organizations, but I was also um, a member of the Turkish national women's basketball team. Um, so in people Turkey, are going to want to know what position did you play? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was off guard. So number okay. two. Very cool. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was like, my uh, specialty was actually like, I was super fast. So uh, that was like a, <laughs> a, a little quirk about <laughs> back from my days but um I was also an Nike athlete um I mean it was very it was a completely different life of course like my life was on the road because we play yeah. like the Turkish league but we also play like the European leagues mm. um during the season um so uh, you know like during the week you'd be in a European country but then during the weekend you would be just playing another city from Turkey so Life on the road, it was like so much fun for me. Uh, and I loved it, actually. It sounds like oh, nice. you must have seen a lot of cool places. <laughs> yes, yes. And it was, I mean, it, it adds up to your look of life, basically, like from very early age, because um, we have like junior national teams too. So I was uh, within those like junior years as well. So since age like 15, I was uh, like traveling with the national team. So that was really fun um but at the same time very interestingly I also kept up with my educational life and which was a different thing for so many athletes because like mm. it, it was usually like you focus on your athletic career or you focus on your uh, academic future mm -hmm. basically uh, but um and so many people like at school, they were like, well, stop playing basketball. In the um, basketball world, they were like, well, stop paying so much attention. 
<laughs> but I was like, well, I can do both. So let me just do both. Wow. And I love that. Yeah, they were like calling me. It's funny because I didn't have like the intention to be a professor, like mm -hmm. till my like master's program, basically. Oh, wow. I never had that. Um, but I always loved learning and mm -hmm. um like uh, I was I was always like with a book in my hand so like some of my coaches some of my teammates used to call me professor oh <laughs> and here you are yeah, that's, <laughs> that's funny that, that and would you read just anything do you have a certain genre that you gravitated towards that maybe led you to your you know ine inevitable career as the professor <laughs> <laughs> well I actually loved uh, fiction. So <laughs> what I do right now, like I read mostly like nonfiction. Yeah. But still, I have that like little passion of mine while I'm commuting, like I prefer uh, or during hopefully like little vacation times, I always go back to that fiction world. I love so How it. did you get, you know, from like continuing your studies while on the road and reading books? What, what sort of narrowed the field of you, of what you were going to research? Yeah, well, uh, um, so I, again, like discovered that passion in me for like learning and then sharing like what I learned, what I research um, with others, like mm -hmm. anyone, basically, <laughs> during my master's program, like I was, you know, like given the chance to actually like create something, share it with um, your classmates, not so much like in the undergrad years back then, like not going back to the years, which <laughs> <laughs> um, so I actually really enjoyed it. So that seed was there. Like I love researching mm -hmm. things. And then um, when I decided to retire uh, from my um, you know professional career, um, it was early a little bit uh, compared to uh, a regular career trajectory. But I really wanted to pursue this other aspects that I was in love, basically. Um, so um, I decided to pursue a PhD in the United States. So that's how I came about here. And of course, like when you came and when you're in a PhD program, you always like try to find that next big thing that you want to research <laughs> and share with so the room. Where did, where did you go for your PhD and what, um, what department was that in? Yeah, so I was at UMass Amherst. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, well, the reason that I chose UMass Amherst, and that was the only place that I actually applied. Oh, wow. It was an instant decision again. Like, wow. I am a very spontaneous. Very decisive, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, like, some people might be like, well, super, um, you know, excited to learn about that some people would be like okay a little bit cuckoo <laughs> over there I think most people would be jealous <laughs> you know <laughs> so I decided to pursue a PhD like around you know like 2009 towards the end of 2009 and it was like around you know like November December and not all PhD programs were still open for mm -hmm. application that I found the UMass Amherst program and I was like so like my ideal um my ideal thought and process was I would be like, um, I had like a couple, of course, like um, roughness throughout my professional sports career. So I was like, well, I'll, you know, like learn it from the best, um, yeah. like how like sports is managed, how it's marketed, and then come back to Turkey and then create an educational program around that. So that was like my thought process. Mm. But again, I'm not like super like long-term planning person even when I try to do it life has other plans <laughs> yeah that's always the case yeah, so I ended up again applying getting accepted came over um, to the UMass program what was the program then, so the program was the, uh, the uh, sport management program in the mm -hmm. business school and it's it's a very interesting program it's very it has like great opportunities because like you can then um, focus on any of the business school's other um, fields like marketing, mm -hmm. management, strategy, um, mm -hmm. economics, finance. So it's very interdisciplinary. Yes, yes. Because wow. like they have like their own PhD programs around it. Yeah. And I focused on marketing too. So I was like um, this uh, PhD student between the marketing department and the sport mm -hmm. management department. And I loved it. Like I loved that opportunity. So my thesis advisor was from the marketing department. Okay. And, like my um, 
again like my uh very into like I actually like go back to my life for my research questions <laughs> so when I came over here and I'm looking at like sports consumption learning more about that and I learned about this um fantasy sports and I'm like <laughs> what is this like what what like <laughs> millions of people are doing this and like coming from like such a different background like of the actual action where the actual action was right, right. So i was like why are so many people interested in this so i decided to focus on that research like what makes it different than mm -hmm. a traditional spectator from a traditional spectator perspective like what is so you know uh interesting in this consumption activity phenomena basically makes it a phenomena yeah and i wanted to you know figure it out so and could you share I'm with those sorry. who are not very sports savvy people like <laughs> me exactly how fantasy football works and you know what is it like can you just explain it a bit yeah yeah definitely so when we look at fantasy sports it's basically um you are uh selecting your own players uh, for a team that does not exist, but the players that you select do. So they are from the NFL, they can be from any NFL team, mm -hmm. and you craft a team of your own from the existing NFL players. And then based on the actual stats of the NFL players, then um, how you did, again, like in a given week, depends on the actual things but then it also depends on uh, to this like depends on this other virtual team who your opponent is like how they crafted their mm -hmm. team. so it's a very interesting mix of reality and virtual uh shared imagination world among the participants of the league so absolutely and yeah. so what kind of questions did you research within the world of fantasy football because i could see there being a lot of psychological <laughs> questions coming out of that <laughs> yes yes definitely so i actually like started with um in-depth interviews mm -hmm. i've started um actually i started like learning more about the experience from the people who experienced it i was like sure. uh, blank slate right mm -hmm. um so i think like that was my advantage so i didn't come to my research with my you know previous notions of course like it was interesting and you know not super relatable to me because i've never done that in my life but um listening from people's lived experiences i got to learn a little bit more about like you know like why is this so engaging basically mm -hmm. um and the research questions that I asked were actually super open ended in the beginning, you know, like, tell me all about the experience. I want to know, <laughs> like, whatever you can tell me and always ended up with, of course, like, I've had my, um, you know, question script as well, but it was like, um, unstructured throughout mm -hmm. the interviews. And it always ended up with, okay, like, I've asked you so many questions, like, did we miss anything? Just tell me. Um, so I, I think like I've learned through the lived experiences of my participants and um the then of course like the more i get into that research the more my questions started mm -hmm. to shape so um my biggest question was uh, like i've had like a couple different papers on um different aspects so the first one for instance was on um so there is this conflict created because people have like all these like players from different teams but there is the traditional NFL spectatorship, right? Like, right. of course, like that is like a huge part of uh, most participants' identity, basically. Yeah. So you can't, of course, let's go of that part, but then you have to root for other, other teams. players. Uh, <laughs> other yeah. teams. So it creates a conflict, especially like, you know, like when they play against each other, like your team. Like, You're right. Yeah. I've definitely heard people that are into fantasy football talk about that a little bit because you know they would watch the games every week and they would be rooting for a team they wouldn't normally want to root for right yes, yes. so i actually like had a paper on like how people cope with 
the, <laughs> the <laughs> cognitive dissonance kind yes. of idea, right? So in terms of like how they do their player selection, so different people have like different strategies to mm. it and how they also like um, manage their rooting interests. Uh, when that uh, conflict arises. So that was one thing. Then another thing was um, actually like, there are so many different uh, components to it. Like there are public leaks, private leaks. So like more theoretically speaking, like how the social interactions play into it. Mm. Um, there is also like that uh, competence aspect when, you know, like, okay, like you can select your players. You have to do lots of research for that, but then, mm. For a newcomer, like that might be, you know, like quite overwhelming. <laughs> so there are actually options about like <clears throat> left, like where the uh, computer selects like the best players uh, for. Right. Them. So like, do you think that, that that removes some of the excitement though? I mean, it's kind of like when people play the lottery and they have the machine choose the numbers rather than choosing like, oh, the birth date of my firstborn child. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it, does it lose something there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely, because that's actually like what I studied, it's like, okay. <laughs> like how that specific control like um, aspect changed, like how people feel empowered, how they psychologically own the experience and how mm. they actually affects their NFL, uh, the amount of the, um, you know, like NFL related consumption they engage with. Um, so it's definitely like... Um, <laughs> yes, like there is that like, you know, starting period where people are more into that like learning curve, but the learning curve is very actually like it's not steep in this. Because um, people really do pride themselves on the knowledge that they have of the sport, right? Yes. Now, I remember when I was uh, in a previous job, the team I worked with, we all decided to do the NCAA brackets, right? Um, and, you know, that's like a very competitive thing. Everybody's trying to choose the winners. And I happened to have heard a story on NPR like that week that said um, that you could win 80% of the time if you just went by time zone. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> Interesting. I know nothing about really any sports and decided to enter this um, just purely on time zone differences. And it really did work out. It, but, you know, there's still a lot of choices you have to make, a lot of judgment calls um, because a lot of time zones are similar, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when people were further removed from their time zone, then you could more easily choose the winner, right? <laughs> so, me and the other novice people that had no idea about sports we all took this strategy and we were beating the people who loved the sport and they were so angry <laughs> it does make sense though that home field advantage by you know taking that strategy a bit but i do know that with this strategy and having the fantasy football the NFL is the ultimate winner here because it has this you know yeah. this audience this people more people started watching right I'd imagine, right? Because yeah. especially with the, um, you know, if you enter any bar and say they didn't have your team playing that Thursday, whatever it is, but you see another team that you're like, oh, my player is up. He's going, yeah, yeah. you're going to be engaged. So not only are you watching your team, but you're watching other teams. You wouldn't, I know some friend, a friend of mine, her husband got into fantasy football and he didn't really watch football, but because his friends were doing it, it kind of pulled him in and he had to watch it. So yeah, it is definitely is the NFL oh, wow. that wins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it is interesting because like when I started working on this, actually like looking at all of the fantasy sports, like the, of course, with the major um, sports in the US here, like fantasy football is like the most popular because it mm -hmm. is like less games, you know, like le the learning curve is less, much less steeper than compared to like fantasy baseball, for instance. Like you need to have like so much more knowledge around like mm. stats and so many games. Yeah. Like you have to do much more research. Whereas fantasy football, it is like um, you know, like it is of course like is engaging, but it requires less effort. So right. it became like much more popular. But uh, when I started. Um, you know, uh, researching it, I was actually, again, very bold, like to just shoot an email um, to, you know, like some people that are in the fantasy uh, football world, like really professionals, and they connected me to 
the NFL, like um, it actually like who was in charge of the fantasy football um, wow. in the NFL at that time. And I was like super excited about this, of course. <laughs> and they were also excited about it because there were like, it was like early 2010s and there were in the, within the NFL, like, um, well, it takes away from the spectatorship perspective mm. as well. Um, so it wasn't like in the beginning. And it, it, if you think about it, fantasy sports existed like long before uh, the internet itself so like people like played it like calculated it by hand there was a commissioner I actually like interviewed a couple of people like that so back in the 90s back in the 80s even like who played that um so uh, you know like the leagues didn't jump like immediately uh-huh. was that because they were concerned about kind of like losing brand loyalty in a way? Because I feel like, you know, fans, they are like almost like super brand loyal loyalists, right? So if they start kind of disengaging with who they're most passionate about, does that damage the loyalty? Yeah, that was that. Those were the questions that were going around, actually. But like, with a couple exceptions, of course, like there were a couple that I interviewed um, that um, actually, um, you know, like, because like fantasy sports are actually like complementary digital experiences. Like they complement the actual NFL spectatorship. So it is like not uh, common that they actually supplement the actual NFL, you know, uh, like the, the traditional spectatorship or the team um, fandom that we know. So it just adds up another layer to it. But there were people, like a couple, again, like very rare, um, that were uh, saying like, well, this is more exciting to me because I have like more, like I have more things to do with my fantasy team than my the NFL team that I've been rooting for. And in those cases, like the NFL teams they were rooting for for a long time were not successful. So they probably like hold on to that, like um, the success of their own winning over just like being loyal to uh, a team that kept losing. But again, like that was like very, very rare. So it's Mm -hmm. not common practice that we see among the consumer experiences. Very interesting. And can you share a little bit more about in terms of digital consumption, what is the what is used, what type of platforms are used for digital consumption and how has that changed since you started to, you know, where we are today? Yeah, well, so much. <laughs> Even like fantasy sports, like it, it, like it has its own technology in, embedded in it, mm-hmm. you know, like it was um, like, there were like two types of, you know, drafting or two types of different leagues. Now, like there are like so many different ways of engaging in fantasy sports. Like there are daily leagues. um, Mm -hmm. There are like, again, seasonal leagues. um, So like so many different formats have come up. Uh, But when we, When we talk about like digital technologies, because actually like one of our most recent paper is on like, like we are like um, actually um, investigating that like special thing about fantasy football, but then we are like crafting like implications around like if whenever you complement the sports experience with um, digital experiences like what kind of design elements you think you should think around so like in terms of platforms of course when we think about like digital there are like so many so many different platforms as well so there's the social media aspect of it there is like every you know team organization um, have their own apps you know, um, different apps, even like for different experiences. Um, Of course, like there is the uh, laptop desktop, which uh, is becoming actually like less of, um, you know, like super engaging aspect, because like most people, um, especially in the younger group are on their phones. Mm -hmm. But then there is like now like the audio version, right? Like, um, without the visual aspect. So there are podcasts, um, there is like social media that is focused around like just audio. Um, So there are like so many different aspects, but there is also like AR, VR brought into that. Um, There is like uh, with machine learning and AI, um, you know, IBM actually partners with lots of sports organizations and teams around their digital experiences. (laughs) So again, like we can, 
talk about like so many different outlets but um another aspect that has uh, become apparent especially like with gen z right like we see more and more um like player focused fandom than like a traditional team focused fandom so players have become like really really important in terms of like the being touch points in right. their experiences so i believe like that adds up to this like uh, to this like fantasy football experience uh, because that is focused around the players as well so, That's so yeah interesting. So, so many As different points to talk about yeah especially with what you were just sharing in terms of people really connecting with a specific player i wonder yeah. if it's because they look at them and they're like there are certain things that resonate with them, that confidence that that person is alluding, or, you know, maybe their personality, just things like that stick with you. And I know from the sports fans that I have in my life, people like Tom Brady, even if you're mm -hmm. not a Patriots fan and you're not interested in Tampa Bay, and that's about my extent of football knowledge right there. <laughs> if, if you go to any of the people will go to those games just to watch him play because He's mm. so good. People say it would be amazing to just controversial too, right? Yeah. So people have yeah. opinions. Yes, yeah. so true. <clears throat> and and it's just and you know sports in general. It seems like there's camaraderie in just watching as a group. So I find it very interesting that you say people are using their phones and kind of doing it a little bit more individualistically, whereas you you think of it more in like a sports bar or you're watching it with your family or friends. Um, I just find that very fascinating, but do you think that fantasy sports is going to just continue growing in popularity or what, what's your, you know, feelings towards that? Yeah. Yeah. I believe so. I, I mean, if you look at like the recent years, like the trajectory, like again, like since it's become, uh, since I've started researching it, but I've also looked at like the stats around too. It's always, it's, always in a growing trajectory mm -hmm. and like recent reports too so when we look at it like you know it's a billion dollar industry um currently and there are like more players also like from an organizational perspective like there are more businesses mm -hmm. coming in the field like every day and it's even trajected to grow like um like just i i believe like if i remember correctly in the last year but of course like when we talk about the pandemic years it's like the rise of the digital <laughs> right right so yeah so it had like for instance a 10 percent um increase um in uh like during that time period like in the just in the recent year as well so i believe it's still growing i mean it might you know like keep uh, there are like so many different um different points to think about about too because like we can be thinking about the fantasy sports alone but then uh, we have to look at like um the trends around sports consumption as well mm -hmm. uh, as i said like looking at like so many um different like um reports and like you know from my students in class too like our discussions it's just changing a little bit so that's like traditional view of like looking at sports. It's like now it's become like a little bit more fluid mm. in, in terms of like what you like in sports. So people have become like a little like those touch points have been evolving basically. Mm -hmm. So looking at that, um, yeah, you know, like so many different dynamics, I, I feel like it is going to grow. Uh, but looking at like different sports being introduced into the field, um, right. I think like that might add up to that um, increase as well. Very interesting. And do you see do you, with your students and um, yourself, just from the research you've done, that it would be important for the NFL and other sports organizations to really embrace that digital experience for oh. <laughs> definitely, yeah. definitely. So, I mean, I, I think like it is, it is like, um, 
you should never ever not think about digital experiences especially mm -hmm. like if, especially like if you're thinking about like the future of um, consumption like everything is converging but it's not i don't also like believe in uh, you know like in a world where everything will be digital because <laughs> as the pandemic showed us like people were hungry for like real experiences right, right after right. like we can't still say that it's over but still like people were so eager to get back to the physical experiences as well so i think like the most important thing in the future will be to embrace them and see ways to complement like how digital complements physical and also how physical complements digital experiences as well right absolutely and, like for instance in the um, last us open <coughs> you know, like they've of course like did so many different regulations like given the context uh, of the pandemic but they've also introduced their own fantasy uh, experience they haven't done that before so wow. us open like they've embraced that and they mm -hmm. actually looked at it as an engaging digital experience so um again like in that introduction of new sports new avenues um i think like that shows the power of digital experiences Absolutely. And I think that's true for not just sports, but we're seeing that in basically every industry, especially with COVID, like you were sharing, it, it, it has expedited the need for digital, for that need for the digital right. experience. And but we're I, living in the metaverse, right? That's what, yep, exactly. It's, and it's, you can't avoid it at this point. We're all speaking in different seats right now, but <laughs> yeah. sharing some type of normal reality. So it's just it's very cool to see it um, in in an industry setting like sports where you have this camaraderie, but there's still this adoption going on because you had to adopt it. Um, you know, with not only COVID, it just expedited it. So it's very, very interesting research and it, it will continue to empower fans. I, I do believe that based on what you've shared with us. Yes. Well, th there are like so many interesting aspects as well, because like in our research, we found like, the, you know, like five different like design elements that actually mm -hmm. any, uh, I mean, we were talking mostly like we were, of course, like crafting our implications towards the sports industry. But like if you think about like creating digital experiences, then you should be thinking about, OK, like in what ways are you giving control to the consumer so mm -hmm. the, that control aspect is really really of course like important like it comes with this digital empowerment and like uh, for instance um it, i didn't know it beforehand but um there is now this fan controlled football league have you ever heard of that no no yeah, so um, I think that like, it's based um, in um, Georgia. So like all the games are played there. And I think like they've done like one season, um, but then they will have their second season like right after the Super Bowl, actually. Um, so basically fans decide on the, um, the you know, like uh, what plays to call. <laughs> So what the roster should be. So it is actually, you know, if you think about fantasy sports, like you create that experience in a virtual world with your friends, with your social circle, um, you have that bragging rights. But with this, it's actually fans collectively deciding on those aspects. So it gives like a huge, like, like it takes that pseudo control aspect of fantasy, yeah. brings it to life, basically. <laughs> really interesting. Um, when you see that, uh, I guess, you know, we're talking about where the origins of this came from, really like groups of friends, small groups of friends, and then it grows. And um, what do you, what do you think about the authenticity hmm. side? Like, it, how do you think that that's developing, especially when you're talking about some of these new ways that people are doing like it's a real fantasy. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep, <laughs> so, I mean, if we, uh, you know, compare the authenticity, this like fan controlled league, uh, football league is of course like more authentic, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's actually happening. Um, and uh, of course, like what, what we have found was actually like, um, there is also an advantage of crafting these like 
virtual, but not, um, you know, like open to everyone kind of experiences because it creates like a shared experience with the ones that are co-creating it. Yeah. So it's yeah. not like, you know, it is not, uh, it's reality, it's authenticity it does not like, it, it, does, it doesn't create meaningful, uh, you know, observations from mm-hmm. other people that are not uh, partaking in that shared space. But that's like little shared experience that you create for individual groups. Um, actually, it comes with that camaraderie um, value, because then it is something that is co-created with that group only. So it's like, it's a little bit more intimate than rooting for a team with people that you don't know. Of course, I get sure. its own excitement. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like more authentic experience, basically. Uh, but there are like different values attached with um, different types of control, basically. Mm. <clears throat> that is so interesting. I think that uh, you bring up some really cool points here. And I, I believe we're going to actually move on to a new segment that we're doing where it's we're introducing this game, we're calling it a uh, react attack, where you're basically <laughs> going to just be sharing some um, ideas that you have the first things that come to your head when Michelle shares a word with you. So mm-hmm. I'm going to let her take it from here. But we're really excited. You are inter- you are the first to partake oh, in this game, and it's only fitting because your you know research is all about games. So we <laughs> wanted to start it with you. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's free association, right? So I'm going to say a word, and it's rapid fire. Don't think about it. Just say the first thing that comes to your mind. It it can be one word. It can be a sentence. But just the first thing that comes to your mind. We're just going to go over ten words. Someone might want to count for me. Um, <laughs> so the first thing I would say is sports. Um, athletes. Podcast. Saying over, oh, podcast. Yeah, yeah, podcast. Oh, um, just HCD, right? <laughs> <laughs> Engagement. Um, pens. Innovation. Um, Lab. (laughs) Social media. Um, Visualization. Digitalization. Whoops. Um, AI. Okay. Artificial intelligence. Oh, my. I just. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) Future. Quality. Uh, Experiences. Content. Evolving. (laughs) That's the last one. All right, the last one. You ready? Yes. Information. Oof. Uh, It's a rabbit hole. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. Good way to end it. It is a rabbit hole. really fun. I think this is your experience is particularly unique. And I think it'll be really interesting to follow your research, especially since this field is evolving, you get to kind of grow your research with it. And that's pretty cool. Absolutely. So can you please share with our listeners and our audience where they can find you and reach out to you or read about your latest research? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I, have uh, of course like they can just go to suffolk.edu uh, um, suffolk university and um, look at my profile up we have like beautiful profiles of our professors um, so we update that regularly so all the links to my research can be found there but i also have um, a google scholar account and a linkedin account um, so if you just type my name uh they excel um um, M-U-J-D-E-Y-U-K-S-E-L. Um, you can just find me on those um, outlets as well. Great. Awesome. And we'll be sure to put those in those links in the show notes as well. So that way people have easy access to it and can reach out to you. But we just want to thank you again for joining us so much for taking time out of your day and giving us a, you know, a couple of sports uh, newbies, an idea of the fantasy football world and really how it is improving and digitizing and growing. We really appreciate it. No, really I interesting stuff. the book a lot. So thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Anytime, anytime. Awesome. 
Great. And the only other thing we want to mention is if you, as a listener, are interested in these conversations and want to learn more, please subscribe, invite a friend, do all these things, comment down below, whatever it is, how you can share it. We appreciate it. And we hope that you tune in for our next Curious Conversation. Thanks so much. Catch you next time. HCD Mindset is produced by Helen Ross. For more information or updates, follow HCD Research on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at HCD Research Inc. and at HCD Neuroscience. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and be sure to rate, review, and follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you and stay tuned for more curious conversations. Thank you.